Thanks, Candice, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to do this. Um, this is a lot of fun and a nice way to spend an hour. Um, again, my name is Jeremy Wardell. I'm an oceanographer at NASA Goddard, and today we're going to be talking about um, observing the microscopic living and non-living ocean from space. Practice, we're going to be talking about using space to monitor ocean biology and ocean biogeochemistry. All right, before we get started uh, in too many of the details, details there. Let me offer one vanity slide so you know who it is you're listening to. Um, I decided that I wanted to be a marine scientist in about 1988 uh, when I took a school trip um, to Bermuda and stayed at the bio station for a week. And like most good uh, future marine scientists, I decided I needed to be touching the water at all times. And so as I traveled through grad school, I spent a lot of time diving. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, given where I ended up, the, um, the path of, of academic research took me out of the water and into the laboratory where my focus started becoming uh, biooptics, and in particular remote sensing, and trying to ask questions like how can we use satellites or remote sensing technologies that don't actually touch the water uh, to tell us something about what's inside of the water. And this led me to Goddard where I started in 1999. I've been an oceanographer there ever since, and I became the project scientist for a new satellite mission in 2015. This is the Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem Mission, uh, scheduled for launch in 2022. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit. I thought uh, some context would be put in by my background. Okay, so the next two slides are just to encapsulate the projects that I'm working on now because as I walk through this presentation, this tutorial, you'll recognize two different flavors. One is all things PACE, because that is uh, my day-to-day -day job, and pointing out where PACE can take this science uh, to the next level. But my other job is a little bit more in the applied sciences um, arena, and I'm part of a project that includes the Environmental Protection Agency, USGS, and NOAA to develop methods for looking at harmful cyanobacteria in U.S. inland lakes. Um, if I have any USGS colleagues on the phone listening in, uh, this project may be familiar to you. It's called the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network. Um, the map on the right is pretty much just showing the depth of interest around the continental U.S. for this project. But what's probably more interesting are the three panels on the left, um, which pretty much indicate the green sludge and slime that we're trying to see from space. Um, and by detecting it from space, creating more of an early warning system for when there might be potential uh, human and health services problems like contaminated drinking water and so forth. So with that, that's enough about me. I just wanted to set the groundwork and the context for the material you're going to be seeing in this tutorial on ocean satellite oceanography. Okay, so I said satellite a few times already. Well, why NASA? Why are we involved in oceanography? Why should anybody with interest in water quality monitoring be thinking about NASA? And why are satellite assets important for this? So one of the um, collaborations that we've had in the past have been with the Chesapeake Bay Program. And this is a really exceptional program and data set that's been collected since the early 1990s, where folks on an almost monthly basis head out into the field on their boats, visit 49 stations, take almost 20 different measurements, and have assembled this massive data set by doing so that tells us a little bit about changes in algal biomass, water quality, and dissolved oxygen in Chesapeake Bay. I know these programs exist um, all over the country, but uh, since this is in my backyard, it was, a, it was a natural fit. Well, as wonderful as this program is, it takes a couple of days each month to make all of these measurements. Whereas from a satellite, with one day of one of our assets called Modus Aqua, this is the view that we can get over on the right. Now, that said, I don't want to oversell this technology because for every day that looks like this, there's a day that looks like that, where the satellite is not particularly useful. 
but we do get days that look like this on the order of 10 times per month. And so why NASA? Why satellites? Well, the measurements from these satellites can complement all of the in situ sampling routines and programs out there with these synaptic and consistent views of our ecosystems. So never misunderstand that we're trying to sell this as a replacement for going out in the field, touching the water, touching land, and doing something with hands, but more as a complement that um, has eyes on your particular ecosystem 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And that's just not possible. Um, you know, with human sampling programs alone. All right. One more administrative thing before I go on. This talk is going to be focusing on polar orbiting satellites. This is an, an, um, an image of what I mean by a polar orbiting satellite. You can see as the red track moves from right to left on your screen, there is a satellite that will be collecting data on the daylight side of the orbit. Now, the way that these usually work is that they are timed to be flying over you at the same time every day. So in the case of my aqua, 11 a.m. every day, it is going overhead. And you can see the kind of swath that it is collecting data over. So every day, we are painting a picture with these satellites of almost the entire globe. Every two days, we have covered every square inch of the globe. Okay. The reason I bring this up is there are other satellite technologies that have orbits that do not behave similarly, or geostationary orbits where rather than traveling around the globe, they are just dwelling on one point in space and time forever and ever. I am focusing on these. Okay, so to the talk and to the tutorial. Um, I'm viewing myself in this as a tour guide for you all, where in 45 minutes or less, you know, discussing everything that's amazing about satellites and NASA just isn't possible. But I'm going to focus on a couple of things that hopefully really pique your interest and get you excited about this as a potential uh, customers and data users of all of this. So maybe there's something you glean out of this talk that might uh, get you sufficiently interested to maybe start looking at some of this imagery by yourself. So we will start at the beginning and what is ocean color? How do these satellites work and how do they measure microscopic marine algae? But then I want to be honest about there are some challenges with this. So while it is amazing, there are things you need to be aware of. And that might guide your selection on how you're using it and the kind of things you're looking for, which satellite you choose to focus on and so forth. And then I'll present some applied science as examples so that you can see some real world applications of this information from space. Uh, this will focus a little bit on my land work. And then finally, what I'd like to conclude with is just making sure that everybody who's listening understands that there isn't a remarkable learning curve to gain access and intuition to these data sets. Hopefully, I do a sufficient job in convincing you they're approachable and they're worth spending some time looking at and you don't need to be afraid. Okay, starting with chapter one. What is ocean color? These three panels illustrate ocean color. The science of ocean color is literally looking at the color of the ocean and trying to infer what's in the water. And just by looking at these images, your eyes and your brains have already developed some intuition for how ocean color works. You're looking at the left panel, you're looking at the blue ocean, just from any experience you've had traveling or reading the news, you already know that that's pretty clear water. There might be some microscopic marine algae in it, but it is not super productive. It is not like looking at your grass in the middle of spring where it's blooming. It is pretty clear, clean water. The center panel, green, of course, is much more productive. It does look like trees blooming in the spring. There has to be some biology in there. And then going all the way over to the right hand side, well, that water's brown. And so that looks like tea. There must be dissolved organics in there. Or maybe there are resuspended sediments. And so your eyes already are operating like a satellite ocean color instrument. The difference is, is that the satellite instrument is actually making a quantitative measurement of this color. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. My apologies. 
And this is what I mean by that. What you're looking at here on the x-axis is simply just the colors of the rainbow by wavelength. And looking at the y-axis here, you are looking at the reflectance, the intensity of the signal coming out as a function of all the different colors of the wavelength. And so if you follow this blue arrow, arrow to this blue panel, you can see there's a lot of intensity in the amount of blue light here, and there's almost no intensity in any of the other colors. Whereas you look over to the red and follow the, this red arrow to the brown water, well, all of the blue light is now gone. There is no intensity there. And there is far more intensity when you start looking at the browns and the greens and the reds that comprise this brown color. And that's all it is. The vertical lines here just indicate the different colors that one of our favorite satellite instruments has measured over time. And you can see that they are spaced intelligently to exploit the differences in what this, these blue and red curves look like. And I'll elaborate on that in a little bit, uh, in, a, in a few slides here. But the take home message is, is all the satellite is doing is operating very similarly to what your eyes are already doing. It's just making the measurements and actually coming up with a number based on the intensity. And by looking at intensities over a bunch of different colors, we can use the spectral distribution of these colors to get some information about what is actually in the water itself. And that is our goal. The satellites cannot reach down, touch the water, and make a measurement, but they can tell us quantitative information about the color, and then using some mathematical algorithms and inversions, we can turn those numbers into biogeochemical quantities. Stay tuned for more on that. Here's looking at that another way. Measurements of ocean color are pretty much just based on sunlight. This is not like a LIDAR or a laser system where you are actively sending light down. It is simply just looking at reflected sunlight. And so you have this downloading irradiance from the sun, where lots of happy photons come down, travel through the atmosphere, and hit the sea surface. And as they penetrate the sea surface, you'll notice that the intensity of the varying colors starts to change. Now, as photons enter the water, or any medium for that matter, there are only really two things that can happen. They can be absorbed, or they can be scattered. And when I say they're absorbed, that means the photon, which has a wavelength or a color dependence, is physically removed from the system. It isn't there anymore. It's turned to heat. Or it can be scattered. That means its path changes direction, and sometimes it changes in enough direction that it exits the water column and travels all the way back up to the satellite signal. So you may be asking yourself, what is it in the water that can actually make photons of light that are all different colors get absorbed and scattered? Well, that's what's in the water. Organic matter, detrital matter, phytoplankton, all absorb and scatter light differently. And that's the fundamental principle here. Because they all scatter and absorb light differently, that signal that leaves the ocean and heads back to the satellite itself contains the information of what's going on in there. Following this up just a little bit further, and just driving home the point that color and intensity and contents of the water are all connected, this is an image of the west coast of the Mississippi River Delta. And as you can see, there are five different boxes with different color water that are highlighted on the left-hand side of this image. Well, we were fortunate enough to be able to make measurements here, measurements very similar to what it is that the satellite actually measures. And I want to drive home the point one more time that these measurements vary with color. And you can see, again, in the brown water, what we're featuring here are the greens and the yellows. As some of the brown goes away, well, now you have a little bit of blue light creeping in, and the greens and yellows dominate. As you get greener, all of the reds go away. And then as you get bluer and bluer, this signal shifts from being dominated with a peak in the center to a peak off on the side. Okay? So now you are all experts in radiative transfer theory and how this entire system works. But again, right now, we're talking about variations in color. How do we get to 
something you actually care about from these measurements of color. Well, there's a lot of way to do this, but I'm going to highlight just one very, very straightforward one. The satellite measures all different colors of the rainbow, but if you just look at a ratio of blue to green, and then you compare that to measurements of chlorophyll A. Now, chlorophyll A is a photosynthetic pigment that is ubiquitously found in all land plants and all phytoplankton. And for the purposes of this, phytoplankton do not need to be complicated. Uh, you can think of them operating very, very similarly to land plants, just that they live in the water. Now, phytoplankton spans algae and bacteria and a lot of diversity in terms of species. But again, for now, what we're trying to be clear about is that one pigment found in all of them has a very clean mathematical relationship just to the color of the ocean. And so in practice, what happens is the satellite measures the color. We take this ratio. We find, OK, the ratio maybe is at 3, which is where my cursor is now. You come up to this line, and you head over, and you say, OK, my ratio of 3 now translates to 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter of chlorophyll. And we've made our measurement. We've related color to biogeochemistry. And getting back to Chesapeake Bay, here are some of the examples of the products that we can produce by simple algorithms such as this. Going clockwise from the left here, I'm sorry, let's go counterclockwise from the left. We have chlorophyll A, which is an, shown in the example of this curve over here on the right. And what this is is a proxy for total algal biomass. So since I mentioned that chlorophyll is found in all phytoplankton, if we know how much chlorophyll is there, we have a pretty good idea what the total biomass of algae is. And so in this case, I didn't add a color bar because it would be very, very hard to read. But the colors from cool all the way up to red simply indicate increasing biomass. So there's very little in the purples and the blues, and there is a lot as you start getting into the greens, yellows, and reds. And for anybody who lives in this area, this pattern ought to be fairly intuitive. Now we can measure other things other than just chlorophyll A. Uh, we can measure how particles scatter light out of the system. And that gives us some information about what sediments in the water. Are there a lot? Are there a little? Are there big sediments? Are there small sediments? A lot of useful information there in terms of water quality. We can look at the use attenuation. What this is a proxy for is water clarity. How deep into the water can we actually see? Maybe if I were a military user, how far can a diver see? How turbid is the water? Is there a lot of materia in there that prevents me from far or from light penetrating all the way from the surface to the sea floor? Why might you care about that? Well, submerged aquatic vegetation, seagrasses, like other plants, need light to grow. If light is prohibited from reaching the bottom of whatever seafloor bottom you're on, well, they don't have sunlight to grow with. And that can change the chemistry of the bottom. It can start things to influence shellfish habitat and a lot of things like that. And then not to belabor the slide any longer, but we can get to dissolved organic matter absorption. So that you can view this as riverine input where there might be humic and fulvic and tea-like substances dissolved in the water. You know, wet years versus dry years, we can see this from this information. And then just frankly, we can look at the reflectances themselves. And this is just looking at red light alone. And as you can see, there are patterns that might mimic what kind of sediments are in the water. So this is what we're really, really good at today and what our heritage instruments can do already for us. But there are other things that we can do. We're starting to think about future missions and what we might try to do in the future. There are a lot of other types of data products that we are starting to be able to create. Those include phytoplankton community composition. And so in this case, you're not thinking about a lot of chlorophyll versus a little chlorophyll, but you're thinking about what is the organism itself there? Why might this be important? We care about fisheries or care about harmful algal blooms, you're less interested in a lot versus little versus what kind 
a cytokine from our algae are actually there. And then we can get on to other things like particle size distributions, which can tell us about water composition, um, carbon budgets, in case you're interested in such things, and a lot of other useful parameters for both open ocean and coastal and inland water water quality. So if you don't believe me, I will point you to the literature. I like to say that if you build the right sensor, people will come. And this is just a small example of papers that have come out over the past couple of years that are making use of these satellite data for all kind of water quality monitoring applications, ranging from uh, the study of harmful bl algal bloom appearance all the way to um, you know, uh, response, uh, ecosystem response to hurricanes and storm surges and so forth. And then in case anybody in the audience is interested more in fisheries or ocean health applications, there is an emerging body of literature that is discussing how to do this better on space. And the reason I put the two reports on the left up is they provide a very, very nice encyclopedic um, discussion of all of the different approaches for trying to understand phytoplankton species composition from these satellite instruments and their uses. And then on the right are two new, very, very approachable papers that have come out that uh, take this informa information to the next level. Consumer guides, meaning that if this interests you, they do a very nice job of exploring all the strengths and weaknesses. So this technology offers the ability to study global open ocean all the way into your estuary for a large inland lake of interest. So now that I've convinced you that this is something that you should be interested in and something that you might consider pursuing, we'll get into some of the more complicated parts of that. And we'll start with the fact that, even though I've already used this term once already, this is indeed a consumer market. And this list is by no means comprehensive, represent, uh, doesn't represent all of your options out there, but it shows a lot. And what I want to take, I want you to take away with is one, all of these different missions have different life cycles, so don't get too married to one of them, but also that there is an international emerging interest over the next five to ten years to continue to be able to make these measurements. The community is all in. And I should note, a lot of these instruments also have atmospheres and land applications too, which by all means broadens the community. The other thing to be aware of are the four different characteristic features of these instruments that are going to drive your decision as to which one to use. The first is the number of colors of light over which these instruments make measurements the number of ocean color wavelength measurements, and the spectral range over which data are collected. And so as you can see, visible is ubiquitous. That's what we really care about, but many of them go into short wave infrared, some go to the UV. But the real challenge is determining how many different colors you actually need. And some are only eight wavelengths, some go to 36, some are hyperspectral, which means they try to measure every color of the rainbow. Now that's impossible, but in practice, it does mean that rather than saying over blue to red light, I'm going to only measure 36 wavelengths at certain channels, it's I'm going to take a one or two nanometer step and measure every color of light over that. So there is a lot of additional information. And I'll explain to you a little later why this is important. The other key characteristics that you're going to care about for the ground sample distance. And what I mean by that is this is the smallest footprint on ground that the satellite sees. And you can see that in meters, it ranges from 10 meters to one kilometer. And why this is important to you is depending on what you're trying to study or learn about, this is going to matter. So whereas we have a lot of familiarity with these one kilometer instruments and they are really, really great for use in the open ocean, well, if you want to study a narrow river or a narrow estuary, one kilometer might be too big. 
But now you're going to start seeing some of the trade-offs. So if you want to have a lot of wavelengths, like 36, well, those are more common for the sensors that are one kilometer. If you really want to drill down to 10 or 30 meters, like we're seeing here where my cursor is, well, now you don't have as many wavelengths. And oh, by the way, the coverage is far more limited. You're not seeing global every two-day coverage. You might be seeing global every 16-day coverage. And again, what I mean by that is the number of, the number of days it takes for a revisit on a single point in the orbit. And so taking MODIS, this top line, for example, it only offers one kilometer coverage, but every two days it's going to see your spot on that. Cloudy or not. If you start looking at Landsat and the Sentinels, well, yeah, these are very, very attractive pixel sizes, but it's going to be every 5 to 16 days before you get a repeated measurement. And depending on what you're looking at, that matters. So, the consumer's market, you need to be aware of all your options out there. There are a ton of options. I have a favorite, so when asked how to choose, Obviously, this is a pandering slide because I'm a project scientist of this mission, but uh, I have a favorite. But in all sincerity, how do you choose? Well, drilling in a little bit deeper to the differences in all of these missions, it really boils down to what you need to study. So I'm going to try to give you a graphical tour through the different instrument characteristics. This is an image of Queensland, Australia from Landsat Group's Ocean Land Imager, and it is a 30 meter pixel. This is gorgeous. Here are all the different things that, not that this instrument suffers from, but that different instruments handle differently. So starting at the bottom here with ground sample distance, and then going clockwise around, we'll walk through these. So again, I said this is a Landsat image, and it's a 30 meter GSD footprint. And so you can really see up into the rivers here. It's glorious. If that's what you're studying, this is the instrument for you. You wouldn't be able to do this with one of the one kilometer instruments. You might get maybe one pixel out here, and then as you travel up the river, you won't be able to see anything. So again, driving home the point that depending on the part of the world you're studying, it's going to narrow your focus on what instruments you spend time thinking about. Now, the instruments are also specialized to do some things very well. Um, dark target versus bright targets. Well, as you can see from this image, the ocean is very, very, very dark relative to land. And it is far more dark relative to clouds and then really thick, hazy, aerosols, like urban aerosols or cephalon dust. And so a land satellite image is designed to perform very, very well over land, not so much over the dark target of the ocean. And so that is not knocking one sensor over the other. It's just that they are often designed with purposes in mind. And those purposes may not suit your needs as an end user doesn't mean you can't, it's just something to be aware of. Rotating up to the top, where you can see that there are these wonderfully cool little filaments. This is tripodesium, which is a particular kind of phytoplankton. And you see these offshore. But there are different kinds of phytoplankton that are congregating near shore, most likely diatoms or something like that. Well, if your interest in, is in identifying different algal groups, then the number one thing you're going to be looking out for in an instrument is what colors of the rainbow is it actually measuring? Because these two different species look very similar in some parts of the rainbow and very, very different in other parts of the rainbow. And if your satellite instrument isn't collecting data where they're different, you're not going to be able to tell them apart. Continuing on in our tour of this image, you can see over on the side here that there are some image artifacts. In this case, Landsat is a multiple camera push boom system. And what that really means is that there are a bunch of very, very different detectors that engineers and scientists spend a lot of time calibrating, but it's a very, very hard job, especially
especially in the dark open ocean. And so sometimes you can see seams like here, which we know are related to the instruments, not to what's actually happening in the water. The reason I bring this up is if you're trying to study something where you want to keep your uncertainties as low as possible, these image artifacts may compromise your studies. There are other studies where that isn't a driving factor, in which case, Yahtzee, move forward, and not worry about this kind of stuff. But all instruments handle their artifacts differently. Even on an assembly line, if you got two identical versions of the same instrument, once on orbit, they will undoubtedly behave slightly differently. And that's why a lot of engineers at NASA, NOAA, and other places spend a lot of time looking at these instruments on the image. Finally, and these are things that we had already talked about, uh, the temporal repeatability of the instruments differ, and then there are other factors called atmospheric correction and and contamination by sun glints that I'm going to elaborate on in the next series of slides. And different instruments handle these things differently. So that is my lead in to chapter two. What are some of the challenges one will have when starting to use these data? So to recap where we are, you hopefully understand some fundamental principles of what ocean color actually is. And now you understand, well, there are a lot of different ways to make these measurements from the different satellite platforms, and you need to be cognizant of the ones that you're choosing. Now, what are the difficulties that I might encounter as I dive deeper into these data? I'm going to focus on four. Atmospheric correction, sun glint, image artifacts, and spectral regulation. And you've already heard me at this point kind of dance around these four topics. We're going to take a little closer look. Okay, so atmospheric correction. Here are the steps for deriving ocean color data products from space in cartoon form. The satellite itself, while looking at Earth, cannot just see the ocean. It sees light coming out to the very, very top of the atmosphere. And this is going to include an ocean signal, as well as a possible cloud signal, as well as light being reflected off of the sea surface, and then any aerosols that are in the way, whether they're just sea salt in the open ocean, Saharan dust, or urban aerosols coming off of a place like New York City. From an uh, oceanographer's point of view, we want to get rid of all of those. And this is what we call atmospheric correction. We try to remove the atmosphere from the total signal so that all we are left with is the signal coming out of the sea surface. Once we've done that, we then take the color of the ocean and relate it to something that we care about, like chlorophyll. And this is what we've talked about so far. When we're done with that, then you can do cool things like spatially or temporarily spin and remap the satellite observations, put them in the GOTF, the overlays, and so forth. But in principle, these are the three big steps that happen. Focusing just a little bit more on step one and why it's a challenge for us, I'm going to show you this plot on the right. And again, you are looking at colors of the rainbow. Oops. Colors of the rainbow on the x-axis here and an intensity of light on the y-axis here for two different examples, the open ocean in blue and Chesapeake Bay in red. And what I want you to take away from this is that the top of the atmospheric top of the atmosphere signal is much, much greater than the water signal we actually care about. In fact, the water signal is often less than 10% of the total signal measured by the satellite, which means we are throwing away up to 90% of the information, and we are trying to tease out just one-tenth of the information from the total signal. That is challenging. It's further, it's hard enough in the open ocean, it's further complicated for places like this. So this is one of our satellites named MODIS, and it's an image collected off of the Libyan coast. And just teasing through it a little bit, what you can see are the Earth is a cloudy place, you will never get away from this. You can also, from clouds, you can also see there are cloud shadows that shine down 
on the ocean as well. And I'm hovering over one here. You'll also notice that there are a bunch of aerosols, in this case sand plumes, that are coming off of land in varying places. Well, we can't really see through these, but when we're just taking a passive look of the ocean and the atmosphere from space, it is difficult sometimes to tell these apart from clouds or from very dark oceans. It's further complicated by the fact that not all plumes like this are created equal. You can see that there's a light colored one, there's a dark colored one. That implies that the optics, meaning what makes them up, can be very different. You can also see that they don't always plume out at the same altitudes. In this case, on the light one, you can see it's right about at the cloud level or above some clouds, or on this lower one, you can see cloud shadows on it. It's a fascinating image. But because of atmospheric influences like this, atmospheric correction can be difficult. It's not to scare you off. It is just simply to be honest that there are places that this works better than others. There are conditions this works better than others. And it's just something to be aware of. Moving to our second challenge, sun glint. We cannot see Earth in color through sun glint. And I think Visually, you might understand that just by looking at this image on the left. Anybody who's flown has seen this as well on a clear day. Uh, there's a really nice article on this that walks you through it if you're interested in the NASA Earth Observatory website. Uh, the link is provided here. But this is another satellite image of what sun glint looks like. Well, the dark ocean over here on the left, we can see. But once sun glint comes in, well, we don't have good ways to remove it yet. And so because of that, all of the data under this glint pattern are not useful for oceanographic applications at this time. Well, so what do we do about that? Well, some instruments make the choice not to look into the sun glint. And we accomplish this by tilting the ocean color instrument for or forward, aft or backward, depending on where the sun is. And so let's explore this a little bit further. If you look at this bottom panel on the left first, what we're doing is simulating one swath of satellite data. And you'll notice that there's a big blue blotch in the middle. That blue blotch represents all of the data we would lose if our instrument looks straight down and stares into the sun. Again. We can't use this. Now, for a scenario where our instrument is looking for an aft, this pattern over here, this big blue pattern, collapses. And so what I mean by that is here's a simulation where I pretend the satellite instrument is coming up over the South Pole. By tilting and looking behind it, it's not staring into the sun wind pattern. And so we don't suffer from this kind of contamination. Right here at the blue dot, which is roughly the sub-solar point, the instrument swings from back to forward, and then for the rest of the orbit, it's looking forward and away from sun and sun wind patterns. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is that some instruments have this tilt capability, some instruments don't. Depending on where you live and what you're trying to study, you may want to choose one of the instruments that performs this tilt, especially if you live in lower latitudes because you will have far more data with which to work. Here is some real life data to drive that point home. On the top, you're looking at an instrument called CWIS, which is a tilting instrument. On the bottom, you're looking at Lotus Aqua, which is a non-tilting instrument. Notice their swath widths are different, so these inter-orbit gaps don't pay any attention to, but these little blobs in the center are the sun glint patterns where there are no data available. For CWIS, they are very small. When you look down at MODIS, which does not tilt, you can see they are rather large. So if you're looking at big open ocean processes over long time scales, this isn't an issue. If you're doing some kind of water quality monitoring where you want every pixel available, it is an issue. Be aware of it. Getting slightly back to image artifacts and instrument design, again, 
this is just a real world example of a one science detector instrument versus a multiple science detector instrument looking at exactly the same machine. When you only have one science detector, there are no image artifacts. When you have these multiple camera systems, you can see artifacts. It's not good or bad necessarily. It depends on your science question, but instrument performance varies substantially. And so be aware of these things. I will point out that all systems with multiple detectors show stripes motion color imagery. Depending on your science question, you can tolerate this or not. But getting back to ground sample distances, there are trade-offs. These single science detector instruments tend to have very large science systems, up to one kilometer. But these multiple detector systems often have much smaller science systems. And so when you're making your decisions, you need to be aware of the trades that you're making. Do I want the cleanest imagery and I can tolerate big pixels versus can I tolerate um, maybe a little messier imagery, but I want the smallest pixel possible. And then finally, to drive home the point about why spectral resolution matters, we'll talk about what we're trying to tease apart in the ocean. So this plot shows a phytoplankton absorption signature in the green curve. It shows the cladal and dissolved material in the green, sorry, in the red and yellow curves, and then water itself in the blue. These are example things that we want to tease apart from the total color intensity. The dots indicate the wavelengths over which this heritage instrument Hewlett is making measurements. And again, you can see that they're positioned to exploit spectral differences in all of these. The problem arises that, in this case, we are making an assumption that all phytoplankton look like this green curve, where in practice, that really isn't true. It depends on light availability, it depends on nutrients, it depends on temperature, and all kinds of other environmental predictors. And so measuring at just a couple of different wavelengths becomes a problem when you're trying to get down to what is actually in the water, what specific algae I want to look at. And this is where an instrument like PACE becomes useful, where by measuring light at a bunch of different wavelengths, you have far more degrees of freedom to start teasing apart differences in these communities. And here's one more real-world example of that. This is a modus image of the Arabian Sea. And the reason I bring up the Arabian Sea is we know for certain that a new phytoplankton group or an emerging phytoplankton group called Mount Deluca is taking over and replacing the diatoms that normally appear there. Why you should care? They form very different parts of the base of the food chain, and they're changing it from a fish-dominated system to a turtle and bird-dominated system. Well, if you're trying to tell these two particular things apart, what a multiple wavelength instrument system like VIRS sees are only these five wavelengths of light over on the right hand side, where the turtle food, the Mount Deluca, are shown in red, and the fish food, the diatoms, are shown in uh, black. And as you can see, they look very similar in certain parts of the rainbow, but only at one place with this instrument system are they different, right around 550 nanometers. That's a not enough information to truly tell these things apart. But a hyperspectral instrument like the one to be flown on PACE will show you are all the different colors of the rainbow. And so by measuring more wavelengths of light, or by choosing an instrument system that measures more wavelengths of light, you have a far better chance of teasing apart the things that you're trying to look for. And I know this is a little bit simple, but this move from multiband radiometry to spectroscopy is really important. And thinking about land transfer, for example, right now we're really, really good in the ocean of just measuring a total abundance. So like on land, that would be saying, I know there are a lot of weeds, but I don't know if I'm looking at a forest, an orchard, a meadow, or cropland. We want to get down to the point where we can distinguish between pine needles, apple trees, grasses, corn stalks. It's not good enough anymore to just know there's a lot of something there. We want to know what it is there. And we need spectroscopy to do that. And this is kind of a slide that I show to managers where it just reiterates that all living creatures are tied to their food source and 
Okay, who disappears or moves, the ecosystem changes. And you want to be monitoring that, just not just on land and by the ocean. And this is where ocean color comes in. So getting back to spectral resolution, and I won't belabor this point, I just want to point out uh, that it's not just phytoplankton we care about, but other particles and other suspended sediment type products also benefit from more wavelengths of light. Um, in this case, what BBP represents on this axis is particle scattering, and you can see five wavelengths, we have some uncertainties, we're using a lot of wavelengths these uncertainties collapsing again. Okay, so trying to wrap this up since I know we're getting ready to run out of time and I don't want to not have any time for questions, we'll talk about applied science as examples. In this case, I'm going to focus on my cyan project here where we're really trying to drill down and look for harmful cyanobacteria um, and present a useful water quality monitoring tool. And what kind of really brought this uh, project to the forefront is water quality issues in Lake Erie. And in this image over here, you can see um, the emergence of this persistent every summer emergence of green cyanobacteria. And it got bad enough one year years ago that it so deeply contaminated Toledo's drinking water that people were, told, people were told without warning, do not shower, do not drink this water, do not touch it, stay away from it. We need to be better than this. Well, NOAA has long been using these data in their harmful algal bloom bulletins. So a real world example is the use of remote sensing to create these bulletins which go out to stakeholders and offer an early warning system of what water quality is going to be like. They, in the bulletins, they don't just hindcast and talk about what it was like, but they do their best to forecast, and they've had a lot of success. So this is a real-world example of how these assets are being used in a water quality monitoring capability. The Cyan project has tried to build upon this, and again, it's a multi-agency activity that is supporting environmental management and public use of U.S. lakes. And we're trying to get satellite data more integrated down into a individual manager's arsenal and toolbox of decision-making tools. And so while I'm talking about the remote sensing here, which is you know, this top work package, I just want to point out that these data are now starting to be used, at least at a state and federal level, to explore environmental impacts, you know, where the data are providing information on linking landscapes to causes of cyanobacterial emergence, or health, what kind of exposure problems can be linked to drinking water that's been, or recreational water that has been contaminated, and you know, where does the satellite system feed into decision-making systems associated with that? Economics, or house prices, changing real estate prices going up and down as you know the emergence of these harmful algae becomes more predominant. And so where our role is uh, as NASA is to develop these long-term time series of cyanobacterial abundance for almost 1,800 resolvable Indian lakes and then feeding it to the other agencies where they are using it in their studies of environment, health, economics, and uh, just general information distribution. And even though it's only been in existence for two years, there are some neat studies that have come out of it. All high type two, where these satellite data records have been used to try to better understand temporal changes in spatial extent of algal blooms. In this case, you're looking at a plot just of Florida, Ohio, and California. And you can see some of the relationships that um, seem to be increasing or not increasing but also in looking at the frequency of high alarming blooms. And so we're trying to tie the satellite measurements to World Health Organization threshold levels where you know, suddenly we're talking about beach closures and so forth. And so what you're looking at on the panel here is a study that indicates um, how frequently blooms are actually occurring in certain inland lakes in Florida. Uh, over time. So again, not diving super deep in this, but I just kind of want to wet your whistle, whistle to better understand that this isn't just a group of scientists on the top of the mountain thinking about climate. There are a lot of real-world applications of this information. 
And then what I'll wrap up with in the last couple of minutes is just, you know, how are these data accessible? How would I use them if I was brand new to the field? And, um, you know, what I want to impart to you is that it shouldn't be mystifying. It shouldn't be a worry. Um, through this NASA website, all of these data are routinely available. It's one-stop shopping. Uh, I won't go through all of this, but I encourage you to explore. But I will point out that you can get FIUS, MODIS, MARIS, all kinds of satellite data in one place. You can narrow it down by the region you're interested in. You can do it over all time scales. And they will even extract these data into little tiny cutouts and provide them to you. So getting the data should never, ever be a problem. If you have questions, there is a wonderful online forum where you can ask your questions. I think if you drill down here, you can see that there are tens of thousands of questions that have been asked. This is a large community of people, and um, we will do our best, and this international community will do their best to help you solve your problems. But once you have the data, we even provide tools for you to use it. There's a package called CDAF. The website is listed on your left. It will allow you to display and analyze any of the data for which we distribute and even more than that. Uh, there are tools in there to uh, create your own satellite, to institute your matchups, to look at time series, to put in your own algorithms. It is all here. Um, it is hopefully something that you would find really, really useful with just the caveat that it is a Linux and Mac based system. There is some support for Windows um, for the visualization, but not necessarily for the data process. But that's getting a little bit in the weeds. Contact me with questions, I'm always. And then finally, because I know that this is a water quality talk, I want to point out that these tools are even available, are even capable of, of looking at Landsat data, even though that is not a typical ocean color instrument. And work is underway to make sure that it can support the Sentinel missions as well. And then what I'll conclude with is that we're trying to really get ahead of steam, uh, maintained for citizen science as well. I have three examples. Uh, the first is this really cool paper that our group put out last summer. It is actually led by a high school intern here where um, he linked satellite measurements to this wonderful activity of one of our former senators uh, used to participated, well, still participates in, called the wade-in, where Senator Fowler would walk into Chesapeake Bay, travel as deep as he could, see when the white of his sneaker disappeared, keep track of that, and then see if that got deeper and deeper with time as an indicator of water quality in Chesapeake Bay improving. Uh, so we participated in that. A really, really cool activity. Um, as part of the Cyan project, the EPA is developing mobile apps that can tell you about spatial extent or near real-time information about presence of cyanobacteria. It's all in the NAPES that are resolvable. Remember, there are almost 2,000 of them in the continental U.S. Um, this is in beta testing now. It's on Android and is hoped to be released soon. Then finally, and this is just one of many examples, if you are really, really interested in making some measurements and you only have $3 to your name, which I know is still not nothing, there are even tools that you can have on your iPhone that can make measurements of water quality that can be linked directly to what the satellite is measuring. And there are a number of examples here. This is one out of the University of Maine. So in conclusion, then, and thank you for your time. I hope I left enough time for a couple of questions. Um, we can do amazing things from space. We can really, really understand how our home planet, our living marine sources are changing with time with these instruments. This is a 20-year animation from multiple instruments starting in 1997, running almost through present day, that shows how our Earth is breathing, how our Earth is changing and evolving over time. We can only do this from space. I find it to be mesmerizing. You can see the seasons come and go. You can see the deserts and the ocean expanding and contracting as things bloom and don't bloom. 
more alarmingly, you can see things like the green progressing northward more and more and more in the spring and summer, suggesting, you know, a consistency with warming. But anyway, we're almost out of time. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope that you got something out of this. And anytime you have questions, 